size of the crowd, I think says a lot about your community that you'd come inside on, on today and figure out solutions to children and youth homelessness. Now the coordinating committee um, wanted me to talk about this in the context of human rights and so I'm going to start really broad um, by talking about it within the context of, of international homelessness. And $1,000 is the answer to one of the most overused rhetorical questions in the history of policy making. It's the question that often precedes equally overused platitudes like you can't balance the budget on the backs of children or the future of children shouldn't be mortgaged away. And the question uh, that that was the answer to is how much are our children worth? $1,000. I didn't make up this number obviously. This is the amount that four policemen were fined for killing 13-year-old Naman Carmona, who was a street youth in Guatemala. And the killing of Naman was one of the worst cases of torture in Guatemala, which is saying a lot. In addition to the fine, it did result in the conviction, two trials and two convictions of four policemen who killed Naman um, and likely killed other street youth. And in fact, the fine was not, $1,000 was the top, the fine itself was between $200 and $1,000. The police officers were sentenced to 10 years. The prosecution would never have happened without the urging of human rights um, advocates who were incredibly brave, who were risking their lives, and that prosecution was certainly a milestone. So a British philosopher once wrote that the deepest definition of youth is life as yet untouched by tragedy. Under that definition, Naaman's childhood really ended far before his life actually did. It ended when he was abused and pushed out into the street at age seven. His gravestone reads, I only wanted to be a child, but they wouldn't let me. They might mean the police who killed him, but it also could refer to all of us who, who have stood by and let children live in the streets and lead lives like this. And I would say that there's a better way to describe our work, your work, than talking about eliminating child and youth homelessness. It's really, in the memory of so many children like Naaman, the work is the work to restore childhood. The Guatemala children um, lived in a country that had been among the first to ratify the American Convention to prevent and punish torture. And Guatemala also ratified the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in May 1988, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Somalia, which is, was at one point one of the two countries that had not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The other one? The U.S. And it, so luckily by 1999, uh, four years after I went to Guatemala, uh, the concept of human rights for street youth and children had evolved. The life of a street youth in Guatemala had risen in value a hundred times over to $100,000. This was the amount awarded by the Inter-American Court, five murdered street children, $500,000. Of course, street children were still being, being massacred. The true power of that case of Villagran will never be the money, but instead the power of applying the laws, the world's most powerful laws, human rights laws, international human rights laws, to arguably the world's most vulnerable and least powerful citizens, street children. And this is what the judge in that case wrote. A world which abandons, abandons its children in the streets has no future. It no longer renders it possible to create and develop a pr project of life. A world which tries to ignore the precariousness of the human condition inspires no confidence. It is a world wherein each one survives amongst a complete spiritual disintegration. It is a world that has become si simply dehumanized and which today needs urgently to awake to the true values. So in 1995, I was in a shelter in, uh, in um, Quito, Ecuador, teaching a young man how to read. And I remember there was a commotion in the courtyard, a loud commotion in the courtyard. We all rushed out there, the other teachers, the people working in the shelter walk, rushed out there. There were two undercover policemen, and they had caught these two young men sniffing glue. Now, they sniffed glue to keep the hunger down and to keep warm. They had two groups of young men form two parallel lines, about 12 to 15 young men, and they ran the two young men that they had caught through this gauntlet, and they had their peers beat them, beating these young men with braided ropes. 
until they came out the other end, falling down, bloody, alive, but barely. The police appeared satisfied, their punishment had been meted out, and they left, and I watched as the staff cried. They wiped their tears away, and they went back to work. Wow, and luckily, the US doesn't do that, right? The Colombian teen who had severe cognitive and physical disabilities, no longer verbal, couldn't talk, couldn't walk, sat there all day, because he had spent most of his life chained up in a basement. I felt that wouldn't happen in the United States. The Costa Rican adolescent who, at a very young age, had been trafficked for sex. Nobody would tolerate that in my country. I was wrong. The average Latin, America, Latin American had a much better understanding of poverty, of compassion, and they were much quicker to share their food and their clothes, and they weren't afraid to speak to the niños with respect and with understanding. There are over a million homeless students in the United States, in the public schools in the United States. Right now, there are over tens of thousands of youth ages 18 to 21 for whom the state never found a permanent home who age out of foster care and the next stop is an adult homeless shelter. Juvenile detention centers knowingly but often begrudgingly release kids to the streets when parents refuse to pick them up. Our shelters, jails, and prisons are filled with young adults whose last home was the streets, and whose next home will be the streets too. We've absolutely failed these young people. We've missed opportunities. We've turned away. And, and as part of a community of lawyers, I'm as guilty as anyone of missing opportunities to help. The law is a powerful force in the lives of these young people. It has a lot to do with why they're homeless, but it can also have a lot to do with why they can move off of the streets. And I don't think that I'm overstating the power of the law. So Sam would agree. Sam was a young man whose father went off to prison, whose mom abused him and then died, and he ended up in a, in a series of um, situations with caretakers who literally tortured him. Uh, they tortured him and his twin brother. So Sam and his brother would um, commit crimes to get out of the house, crime after crime after crime, just trying to get away from the caretaker. Every time they would return him to this caretaker, not related to him, had no legal right to, to have him and his brother. So um, Sam would actually run to these lockdown facilities in Seattle and beg to be locked down in them so he wouldn't have to go back. His way out, we filed a, a legal action called the non-parental custody action that placed him with a caring neighbor. And he eventually reunited with his family. Alicia would agree, I think, that the, the law is very powerful. She was a young woman whose parents had left at 14. They had gone off and, uh, to join a cult, and literally the only forwarding address we could find for them was Africa. But Alicia survived for two years on the streets. The thing she couldn't do was get a place to live because she was only 16. Her way out was um, an emancipation decree, decree allowing her to sign, sign a lease. The law was powerful for Alicia. Serena would agree that the law is powerful. She was a youth who had been in the care of abusive relatives and had to file her own dependency of petition. She had to ask the state to put her in foster care. Now, I think if a youth like that can persevere, we can certainly make a commitment to strive to do the near impossible. We can both advocate for our principles and live up to them. My first client as an attorney was a 16-year-old homeless girl who was beaten and then abandoned by her parents when they moved to another state. She had been abandoned by the state when they didn't have enough foster homes to house her. She had been abandoned by everybody. She just needed a little help. A legal emancipation to access services and housing. She had identified an apartment that would take her if she could get this. And we were successful. I remember going before the judge, and the judge was just blown away at her resilience. He said, I can't believe you've gotten your GED, even though you had no place to live. I can't believe you stayed out of trouble with the law, even though you had no place to live. We, we celebrated, the judge shook her hand, she went out. The next day we were, or I think it was a couple, maybe a couple days later, we were out on the streets doing outreach again. We used to do outreach uh, on the streets and, and there she was again on what's called the Ave by the university in Seattle, out on the streets again and I was crushed and I, I, cause I thought we had made a difference. I went up to her and I said, didn't, didn't you get this apartment? I thought the emancipation out. And she looked at me, how many of you have, have adolescents? or work with adolescents. So you know that look that they give you when, when they're just, it's pitch your pity that you don't understand, right? <laughs> she looked at me with that look and she said, Casey, and I think she put her hand on my shoulder. She said, I'm out here doing my third job as a peer outreach worker for other homeless youth. The youth says, 
Where can I find a sense of stability? And the child welfare worker says, with tears in her eyes, you'll find it in the 30 different foster homes you'll be placed in. The homeless child says, where can I find an education? And the, the teacher says, sadly, you'll need a home before you can be in school. Where can I find a home? Please, the street kid. Stop living on the streets, retorts the state. Your home hasn't changed. It's where you left it. How can I be protected from the abuse of my parents, cries the young girl. Stop being such a horrible kid first, the community responds. Where can I get the tools to live like an adult, wonders the young man. Show me you've lived on your own, you've taken care of your housing, financial, emotional, and educational needs, and then, and only then, will we give you the ability to succeed as an adult, replies the legislature. How can I stay out of, get out of jail, asks the gang-involved kid. Do something about your abusive parents, your learning disability, your inappropriate sexual orientation, your lack of adult skills, your emotional deficits, and then we'll keep you out of jail. Or we'll charge you with adult crimes. This is a, a country in, that, where throughout the nation, our juvenile justice system exits tens of thousands of kids onto the street. There, our foster care systems allow failed adoptions and artificial age restrictions to let kids fend for themselves at 16, 17, 18 years old. Our legislature in Washington has said it's wrong, but saying it's important, but it's the easiest part. There's nothing in the act that actually provides any rights to anybody, but it is a critical first step. Says we know there's not enough services to meet the needs of these youth. But the many, many youth who've been protected by human rights laws in our community, law, the law was out there to help them. But what they needed was someone help them make the law work for them. I learned early on that the most effective solutions come from the community, communities themselves, not from outside of the community. They come from the teacher in the school, the caseworker in the state, the mayor. I think that's incredible that the mayor is here. Um, the public defender, the prosecutor, the youth, the neighbor, the pastor. Collectively, you are the human rights advocates who will determine whether the inalienable human rights these children have are respected. That's regardless of whether the U.S. ever signs the Human Rights Conventions. You control whether homeless children and youth will have their inalienable rights protected.